Max the other day said, uh, Quiet, please. Daddy, what do you call a fish with no eyes? What? In four, <laughs> three, two. The Awful Company presents a truly terrible podcast. Welcome to Nonsense episode number 007. I'm Jeff Parker. And I'm CJ Little. This is our take on the week's business tech and entertainment headlines. This time, we'll look at airplane close calls, Bing GPT, and finally, the end of the Boeing 747. I don't think we've ever once covered an entertainment headline. There's too many other cool science-y things happening we're, we're in the world. A, we're a lie to we, our listeners. Congratulations. It's our Bond James Bond episode. Who's your favorite James Bond? Daniel Craig. See, I mean, the gimme, the easy one, of course. Connery because he's amazing. Oh, he's great. He's good. I really liked Roger Moore. He's not. He's no one's favorite except for mine. But I really like Roger. There's, like, there's some fun. He, he just kill, especially really later. Good. He plays it so cutesy. Yeah. But if you look back, he was on some spy TV show that was was pretty good. The Saint. The Saint. Simon Templar. He played Simon Templar. Yep. Simon Templar. And it's kind of fun. He just covered an entertainment headline from 50 years ago. But hey, <laughs> we worked it in. <laughs> How was your week? It was good. Did you watch LeBron James break the I didn't. NBA scoring record? I didn't, career but it was record? pretty cool. Now, the cool thing was the day after LeBron hits that shot and they have a huge, they stop the game, they have a huge celebration, and, and Kareem Abdul Jabbar, whose record he's breaking, is there, and it's a big deal. The day after they announce about a thousand trades from, from the Lakers. So that so literally that next game, there's like only eight guys who are eligible. It's an extremely small skeleton group. I was really hoping at some point they would put in Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, <laughs> let him make six or eight points, have a big celebration for him for breaking LeBron's record. That's great. That would have been amazing. <laughs> and then just go back and forth. Just have a race. Bring LeBron back, have the celebration That would be the again. best thing for the it NBA. It would just be like a week of partying. It's a great idea. <laughs> Should we get to our headlines? <laughs> yes. Can pigeons match wits with artificial intelligence? I say yes. In a new study, psychologists at the University of Iowa examined the workings of the pigeon brain and how brute force of the pigeon's learning shares similarities with artificial intelligence. Brute force is how I've gotten through life. The pigeon's brain works very similarly to, to AI. But the difference is the artificial intelligence won't shit on you. <laughs> what are we training pigeons to do? Well, I'll usually play the piano. Is that, is that a thing? Have you never heard seen pigeons no. poking at the keys of pianos? Yeah, it's like under a rock. You can teach pigeons to do little sequence of, sequences of events, and they learn, oh, if I do this sequence of events, I get a treat. But it's like Pavlovian memorization sort of thing. It's just, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> literally like AI. It's brute force I'm not, a, I'm not a pigeon fan. They fly. They do fly. They have a Z-axis. They do have a Z-axis. How are you not excited about anything that has a Z-axis? Ah, there's plenty of things that fly that I could do without. <laughs> okay. Insects. I mean, I'd like to bring back pterodactyls. Oh, wasps. Oh. Fuck wasps. You're Huge. upset about wasps, but you're yes. fine with pterodactyls. Yes. Okay. Yes. Final answer. No lifeline. I'm, I'm not going to live in your world. <laughs> you think a wasp bite hurts. Yeah. Good point. It would be kind of cool if I had pterodactyls living in my backyard. That would be kind of cool. I'd, I'd have I'm not going outside. I don't think, are they By the way, I'm, I'm generally like terrified of animals bigger, larger than me. I think that's smart. Getting in the water with the dolphins at the where they want you to pet the dolphins and watch yeah. the dolphins. I mean, a dolphin. Absolutely terrifying. I'm fine me. with a dolphin. Killer whale, no go. Hard no. Killer whale's a dolphin. It's just a big dolphin. So there are no big animals, animals bigger than you, that you're comfortable with. I don't I'm want to be around cows. an elephant. Yeah, of course. Put up a cow. Now, bulls. No. I don't want to be around a bull. Nope. You want a fence between you and them. A hundred percent. That's how I feel about most of the people in LA. <laughs> <laughs> a family that we were friends with had a bull. To get out of their yard, you had to go through the pasture or else or else you had to walk really far around. You had Jesus to get Christ. through the pasture where the bull was. <laughs> they were fucking meant, with you. Which meant you had to run as yeah, fast exactly. as you humanly hey, hey, could. Hey, hey, Jeff, wear this red sweatshirt. <laughs> yeah. And then we're just going to stay back here and watch, okay? This oh, is no, just for my YouTube channel. Their son channel. was with me. Yeah, we had totally. to run as fast as we could. To yeah. get to the other side before yeah. the bull got there. Why did they have a bull? Well, they were breeding cows. Oh. Well, you didn't left that out. They were in the business. Of, it wasn't a hobby. They were professional. I don't, you just this. said they had a bull. You didn't say they had a bull and like a bunch of cows. Nobody has, nobody has a bull as an amateur project. I thought project. you found <laughs> This is not a science fair project. This is why episode six should have been the last episode. Because <laughs> clearly we're off the rails. You want to read an amazing story if you haven't read this. Uh, B.F. Skinner and the Superstitious Pigeons. If you take away all the other variables so they have no other stimulus and you have the pigeon in the white box with nothing to distract them okay. and just throw in the pellets when they do random things, 
eventually they start doing random things that they think are the things that got them the pellets. They'll start and, spinning in circles and doing all... You quickly learn how cults are created. Say, let's be clear. You put me in a clear box and I do random shit and you give me food, I will keep doing the random right. shit. Right. You'll just keep, ma- keep making this things makes up. Makes perfect sense. So if I slaughter the sheep and the blood goes on the farmland and we have a good crop, that means every year I slaughter the sheep now because now I want the good crop. I mean, that's yes, just literally what happened. Of course. 100%. Why change it? And then if it doesn't work, you just you blame the sheep. You do the same thing next year with the better sheep or you start thinking oh but i was wearing my red hat that day so it must be the red hat ah, that causes the good course. crop yes no yeah. i understand this raises the question can you get superstitious ai oh i think that has to be true it, of course it, it has to be true it's just a it's just a it's just a miscalculation a, a of what toward, yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah of yeah. what caused that event yeah china refuses to take a call from the u.s because the atmosphere wasn't right you know this was this is the balloon story sure and we called them to tell them, hey, we popped your balloon. Yep. And and uh, and they wouldn't take our call. Nope. They were sad. They're grumpy. It made me think of like your girlfriend in sixth grade. Yeah. And, and the atmosphere just wasn't right, so she no. doesn't want to talk to you. Of course. And then also uh, there was another balloon that was shot down over Alaska on Friday. They didn't but actually pars- call it a balloon, though. No, right? no, no, they're saying it's some sort of aircraft, but it was a forty thousand feet, so it actually yeah. was endangering, potentially sure. endangering aircraft. So. Yeah. They, they wanted to get it out of the way. I feel like there's an opportunity here. What's that? Train the pigeons to bring the balloon down. Balloon, not balloon. <laughs> balloon, not balloon. <laughs> balloon on These the ground. These fucking pigeons are attacking the planes. We don't know why. Well, it's not a balloon. What do you want? <laughs> I think they're just trying to send us a gift. This is my whole theory. Do you remember the, when, when there was this thing after 9-11 happened? No. We created this thing called the Information Awareness sounds, Office. Sounds like propaganda. Well, they wanted to know everything about everyone, every conversation, everyone. Okay. They wanted to be able to Patriot eavesdrop Act. on everybody. Yeah, it yeah. was after the Patriot Act, correct. Really? Okay. And and they literally wanted to like know everyone's location at all times and who all was talking to whom. I've read this And they book. wanted to have this, yeah, they wanted to have this in a giant database where they could follow all this stuff. And of course, everybody went, you know, well, there's pri- giant privacy issues <laughs> well, here. This no. Is, this is insane. <laughs> yeah, We're not going to agree there. to that. And then in 2007, the iPhone came out. Yeah. Success. And we all signed up for it. No problem. <laughs> you yep. want to know where I'm at? Yeah, That's I am. fine. And you know the difference? One has Facebook and cats. Exactly. Because yeah. one has Candy Crush. Even worse. And you're willing we, to give away all that information we now. We were all because so you grumpy had, when they were like, oh, we're going to do facial detection of everyone. We're that, gonna, was, that was part of the, the and then uh, what information awareness office. We, we got the fucking people to tag the photos of who was what. We literally trained the system sure. by the people that are in there. Let me is, give you my fingerprint while I'm at it. Well, that's why I go to Facebook and I mistag things constantly. Okay. <laughs> like, there'll be a picture of an otter, and I'm like, that's Jeff Barker. Yeah, <laughs> Fantastic. Right there. So the Chinese are supposedly spying on communications data with these with the balloon, at least the first one that had antennas. For, I don't know what they could have gotten from that that they couldn't have gotten from a satellite that has you know bigger, sure. better equipment and can yep. hold heavier things. And so my thought is, if they just include a couple orders of egg roll... 100%. It's much like the phone. Yep. We would welcome it with totally. joy. I would order it. Exactly. Yep. How lovely the Chinese have sent yep. us hot and sour soup. Number 36. Exactly. Please deliver it. Yep. <laughs> they have all the data. You want to survey the data? Yep. Knock yourself out. You're welcome to it. I want the Kung Pao. What do you think is really inside this thing? Well, the first one the first one they shot down. Was big. By the way, this is not the first one that floated over. We've had sure. other ones float over. Of course. The first one, they had antennas and they were supposedly collecting communications. Okay. First of all, a spy satellite could probably do that much, much better. Sure. Or, or say, a tourist on the ground with a little radio con, you know, contraption sure. probably could do that. Mm-hmm. And in 2023, if you aren't strongly encrypting your communications, you either want them stolen or you just deserve to have them stolen. Sure. Is this a honeypot? Is this like... We put this up there and they want to see how you take it down and see how you get to 100%. it. hundred percent. Like this is them checking our yeah. air defense missile system. Like exactly. To if see, you are we the... going to shoot down the, the balloon that we don't know what because it is? Because you don't get to see the missiles unless they shoot them at you. Right. right. You and that s- would tell them a ton. That actually makes a lot of sense. That's, that's what I wonder. It's like you put the thing up there and be like, oh, please don't give us our balloon. And they shoot it down. And you're like, thank you for the images of the whatever the missile. Right. Now we down. know how your air defense yeah, missiles work. There's more to this story. EVs are not enough. Polestar and Rivian urge more drastic climate action. The two EV manufacturers collaborated on a report that says the auto industry is way behind on its climate goals. Yeah. I never thought that we'd be able to do all of this with cars. Cars was just a step, right? Oh, the fastest way to do it is to stop eating meat. Yes. But meat is delicious. Have you tried a Beyond Burger? I have. They're, they're good. good. They're yeah, great. They're good. They? They're sure. really good. Have you tried Impossible? Do you have a preference? Um, I haven't. I haven't done them close enough where my brain's been able to tell me which one I like better. I, I think I like the Impossible better. I've done a side by side comparison. Yeah. Yeah. And I like them both. You like them both? They're yeah, both yeah, yeah. terrific. So what you're saying is I should be having a 
Impossible Burger inside my EV and not, not yes. scarfing down in and out in my <laughs> diesel truck. Man, Costco has a cashew-based dip, like chip dip. Yeah. It's incredible. Have you tried ice cream that's cashew yes, milk based? Yes. It's better than it's better than ice cream. cream. It's yeah, delicious. Yeah. And weird. After you eat, you don't feel like shit. Neuralink probed for allegedly transporting contaminated devices removed from monkey brains. This is uh, this is Musk's company, right? Yes. They implant the chip in the monkey brain so that it can interface directly with the computer. For some reason, this is better than a mouse. And they don't. Uh, <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah. Hey, where's your mouse? I don't use a mouse. I use a monkey. <laughs> I got a monkey. Here. I got a monkey over there. I tell the monkey what, what to, to type. Do. Left and left, it just thinks. Up, click, <laughs> click. No, no, right click, and then halfway through he, th- he throws his shit at me. <laughs> well, the mouse is gonna give be me the mouse. Anyway. Give me the fucking mouse. <laughs> Elon, your monkey's a stupid idea. <laughs> All right, let's talk about some interesting plane interactions, or fortunately lack thereof, in uh, Austin last week. Push the button. happened to see the near collision at the Austin Bergstrom International Airport last week? I did not. Where is that? That is in the great state of Texas. Okay. Imagine I, if you had a big bowl of tomatoes. In the city of Bergstrom? In the city of Bergstrom, right? Right <laughs> next to Austin. Okay. I don't know who Bergstrom is. I'm assuming he was important. You know, if only there were a device where we could quickly look that like up. Like a network of machines? That, that would be great. Connected Too bad to one such another. a thing doesn't exist. Yeah, like a series of tubes. So there's a FedEx 767, which is a wide-bodied uh, cargo plane. Big wide that body. Was, yeah, big plane. It was cleared to land uh, at about 6.40 in the morning. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just before it was expected to land on runway 18 left, a air traffic controller gave the go-ahead for a Southwest 737 headed to Cancun to take off. Yikes. Yeah, this is a yikes moment. So, How come no computer is is keeping track man, of these things in they, some way that they have keeps tried, that from happening? They've tried to automate the ATC system for years, and apparently it's constantly failed. They just can't Why is that so things. hard? I don't know. It's a good question. I think a lot of variation... And also zero room for error. Of course, right? of course. Which, which this is an which example is why of, it should right? be which is why it should be automated, not you would not think. up to a human. Yeah. So look, I'm no physics or aviation expert, but I'm pretty sure that when two physical objects uh, try to occupy the same space at the same time, you have bad a problem. Things happen. Sure. Yeah. So, so the folks at, um, at at Vast Aviation created an animation based on their analysis of the ADSB data. So that's yeah. the, the transmitter data that's sent out of the planes. Mm-hmm. Um, at a the little, time, re- a little reenactment video. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A little reenactment animation, which is which is pretty crazy. And you hear the pilot of the FedEx uh, 1432 flight. So FedEx 1432 heavy. He gets clear. What does to that land. mean? Heavy? Does that mean it's it's loaded? It's full? It just means I go to Suplantation a lot. Okay. <laughs> well, what are you gonna judge? Okay. I have a name. Okay. My eyes are up here. <laughs> right. No. So um, you do hear that a lot. So uh, heavy means. That it's a larger aircraft, and the reason this is relevant is uh, we. And by the way, we figured. But I don't know that just from the name seven sixty seven. When you're on the radio, you only say your flight number. You don't say the type of plane you are. Okay. So you would say. So you hear them say like FedEx fourteen tail number. No, no, the flight number. What's the difference? The tail numbers is the plane. Okay, the and the flight, flight number, number is, is the. the way, okay, got it. Yeah. Got it. And so, like for example, and this is maybe a, a reasonable um, tangent. The uh, the Air Force has two 747s that we use to transport our own VIPs. Okay. If the president is on it, it's called it's Air, Air Force, Force One. One. Sure. But if the president isn't on it, it's another call sign. So you always know that if a, if a plane is referred to as Air Force One, the president is on it. Right. And if Period, the vice president's stop. on a plane, it's Air Force Two. That's uh, just their Uber. Oh. <laughs> okay. They don't. They don't. Do You're very nice to vice they presidents. They don't get planes. No. <laughs> no. Um, okay. So. Heavy uh, uh, is used to describe large planes. And the reason this is important is larger planes need to provide a larger gap for smaller planes oh, sure, behind it sure. because of wake turbulence. Yeah. And there are, well, there used to only be three categories. You want to guess what they are? Uh, light, heavy, medium. Light, medium, heavy. There you go. There is a fourth one now. You know what it's called? Super heavy. It's literally called super. Wow. And the only planes that have ever been in that category. Because I knew it wasn't going to get lighter. It wasn't like it wasn't was going to be ultra lighter. light. Nope. Uh, the only planes that have been in that category are the A380, which is the Airbus uh-huh. double-decker. That's a big plane. And and uh, the um, the Antonov uh, 225 used to be in that category. It's now been destroyed. Yeah. But you only have the I A380. never knew about this plane until you told me about it a couple of weeks Amazing ago. Amazing plane and very sad that we'll almost certainly never see it again. Yeah. Um, I think it would be great if there's an opportunity for the Ukrainians to rebuild it, but the, the 
math just likely won't make sense. Also not a priority at the moment. Yeah, bigger fucking problems right now. Um, like mainly getting their internet turned back on. The the uh, You hear FedEx 1432 Heavy get cleared to land. Yeah. And then shortly thereafter, Southwest 708 flight is cleared to take off. Now the Southwest flight starts to roll down the runway. Mm-hmm. He might be a little bit later than expected. Like I'm talking like on the order of like 15 or 20 seconds later, okay. not significantly later. But it shouldn't be that tight. Yeah. You've got to have a little more. more yeah. Uh, yeah. So he's barely accelerating for takeoff as this big fat 767 is coming in at about 140 knots. Does he see the, the 767 so, in the sky? So it's kind of nuts because at this time, one, it's dark, mm-hmm. 640 oh, in the morning. Oh, that's true. And visibility was terrible. There was fog and frozen fog, which I also didn't know was a thing. I, I still don't time. know it's a thing. What's frozen fog? Uh, really cold fog. Okay. So uh, at one point, the 767, he gets down to like 75 feet. Yeah. Right? And it, it, it appears to be within a couple hundred feet of the 737. So he's bearing down behind oh, the 737. Oh. Yeah. And, and there's passengers on the 737. Yes. It's going to Cancun. Yes. Okay. So like 100 plus passengers are on this thing. Yes. It's hard to tell because you don't know where the beacon is on the plane. So we, like, we don't know absolutely how close they were, but yeah. you still know they're pretty damn close. But, you know, again, visibility was bad, uh, so it, it didn't help. But th- the part that, that really impressed me on this was listening to the pilots and the air traffic controllers during this. It's absolutely amazing how calm and collected they stay the entire sure, time, which sure. is what you want, right? Right. The only hint of excitement I heard is when the incoming FedEx 767 Heavy flight is bearing down on this little tiny 737 right, right. and he tells the southwest pilot to abort so traffic sure, control didn't, sure. even, didn't even catch this right you hear the 767 the, pilot, the inertia of that giant plane he can't do it right? there's not a lot that he can do no uh pull out I and mean, that's really right. all you can do right so he actually gets on the radio and 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 tells the 737 pilot to abort to which there is no reply so i don't Uh-oh. know if he didn't hear it or or yeah. whatnot moments later you hear the austin tower instruct the southwest flight to quote turn right when able which is kind of hysterical to be like, oh, you're taking up. Oh, turn right when able. Sure. The Southwest pilot immediately responds with negative. Right, right. Because right? he's how trying to get, take How am I going to do that? Yeah. So, and it, and it kind of sounded like a, like a nope, like I'm not going to do that, my friend. Like I'm just, I'm here to take off. The FedEx pilots did the reasonable and rational thing, right? They pulled back to climb out of the landing attempt yeah. to prevent a collision, which would, of course, be, be terrible. But they were down to 75 feet. 75 feet, yeah. yeah. So That's th- too close. This is not, like, this is not typically... Uh, as exciting as this yeah like this process is called a go around all pilots have practiced it they know how sure. to do it there's a procedure in the plane for it. they just get back in the lineup and land again it adds 15 minutes to their flight it's not now, with big bad deal. visibility how does he know southwest is below him well i believe i don't know this to be factual but i believe that he could see him at this point because okay. visibility was down to like a quarter of a mile yeah and he was closer than that which is petrifying right um so yeah so he saw them and then tried to wave them off couldn't wave them off he just got back on the throttle and banked left, Went got back, back in up. line. Yeah. So um, so then when the FedEx flight comes back in for their actual landing, right? They, right. They sort of do this go around. So he comes back in, does his his landing that's unremarkable, what you want, very, you know, typical typical landing. And as the Austin Tower was instructing the FedEx pilot how to exit the runway, which is the, the classic yes, thing they do sort of standard procedure. I detected this little tiny bit of sarcasm in the, in the well, heavy sure. captain's voice, right? The heavy sure, captain was like... I mean, it was like minuscule because he's 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 a pilot. He's professional, but the but tower, he had to have a little adrenaline hit. Yeah, right. And the tower came back immediately with a FedEx one four or you know FedEx fourteen thirty two heavy. Roger, sir, you have our apologies. We appreciate your professionalism. Yeah, which I thought was really like that's the most you're that's ever going to hear out of ATC of being like we totally fucked this yeah. up. Yeah, and everyone involved in the thing Good was like them. as professional as they could be. It's what you want, right? When a couple pieces of like meatware are yeah, in right, charge right. of hundreds of lives and millions of dollars of aircraft. And my, my primary takeaway was I'm still that. not convinced meatware is the best way to be flying I'm with those you. Planes. That's going to be another segment or two, I think, because I yeah. know they've tried to automate this and, and certainly had issues. But my primary takeaway was just how professional and calm and safe pilots are, right? Yeah. Like, but my secondary takeaway, which I think you'll appreciate, was that I've been doing radio signaling wrong the entire time, right? My oh, entire yeah. life. Yeah. And, and listener, you may not know this, but Jeff and I are, are licensed ham radio operators. Well, sure. We, we actually, I know we're nerdier than you, than you thought. We both got licensed together. I believe, I think the story was, we literally went, remember the guy that was like, the dude who was like 90 who was doing our setup? Oh, yeah. He referred to it as a school for the, for the blind okay. and told us like three times that they couldn't see. But here's the part that, that you know, the sad part of this is that Jeff got a much better handle than me, and I'm still grumpy about it to this yeah. day. I'm still, this is true, I'm still grumpy. Three of us went to take the test. 
Jeff gets KF6 EVY. Lippy gets KF6 EVZ. Sure. Guess and my dumbass you. gets stuck with KF6 EWA. Yes, yeah. there's a W in my call sign. It's not easy the to say, is it? The letter to say the English language sure. is in my call sign forevermore because I'm too lazy to get a handy <laughs> sign. And, uh, but anyway, I feel like the next time I'm CQing with somebody or just hanging out on the 435, I'm going to refer to myself as KF6 EWA heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's talking about this, but the race for artificial intelligence is on. And nowhere is that more evident than in search. Uh, uh, I don't know if you've paid attention to any of this, but uh, uh, Microsoft has put up first a billion dollars for ChatGPT. Now they kicked in another, whatever it was, $10 billion. They're going to make Bing GPT, their version, their version of, totally. of, yeah. Have you started using ChatGPT for search? I'm waiting until they put it in the Clippy. Clippy GPT is what I'm waiting for. <laughs> okay. That's really, we talked about this before. That's what I'm waiting for. I have two buttons on my browser toolbar for search. One is DuckDuckGo, which I love. And then the other one, I have added ChatGPT. Because as much as it seems like, why are you using the AI thing? It's so much faster for me to ask the question sure. and have it give me back the answer instead of give me, giving me a list of links sure, to go and, yeah, yeah, that yeah. you then have to walk through. Yes. I want to say yes. Yeah. But I think, and I think you're going to get into this. You need to have a little more behind it. And I think that's what Microsoft seems to be doing a really good job with with Bing. What do you mean by more behind it? So at least with links, right? The yeah. sort of the, let's call it the Google model. Yeah. At least I can look at the source and I can try to say, do I think this is real or not? Like, is this some clickbait farm page somewhere? Oh, yeah, yeah. Who's giving me false data intentionally. Right? Yes, so like yes. I'm look if I'm looking up, let's just say hypothetically, I would have never had to do this, the weight of a Boeing 747. Yeah. Now, if I see some random page that's like clickbait dot, you know, ABC one, two, three dot CO, I'm probably not going to believe but that. But Bing will fix that because you'll get citations. Yes. That's what I'm saying. You need to know what's behind it. The citations right, right. are really what help. Now with ChatGPT, you don't get that. ChatGPT right. just gives you an answer. It'd be like a Boeing 747 weighs 73 pounds. Right. And you're like, do I believe it or not believe it? Well, you have to go and check it. There's, well, or you can't really but use it. But why the fuck? What that was the point of me searching for it? If I knew the answer, I wouldn't have asked it. Yeah. Right. So, like, you gotta like that step to me is still broken. You can't trust the thing until you and get citations. And that's where I think Microsoft is really helping that quite a bit. Did you see the demo for Google's new AI system, Bard? Uh, I did not. Powered by Lambda, the language model for dialogue applications. Great name, guys. And it makes an error. Oh, it does? They actually make an error. Yeah. They they ask Bard, uh, you know, who took the first pictures of planets outside of our solar system, and Bard says that it was the Webb Space Telescope, and of course it wasn't. It was the European Southern Observatory's very large telescope. So it got it wrong. It totally gets the answer wrong. Now, by the way... And they still run the ad? They didn't know. No. They, they didn't know when they released it. Oh, my God. That yeah. it was giving them the wrong they, data. So they put an ad out and they with this and they can I tell you something? Nobody fact nobody nobody fucking Googled it at Google. Nobody you'd, Googled it. You'd think. Now here's the cool thing about it though. It's truth in advertising. Yeah. Because that's what you're actually gonna get with, with a lot of AI right now. You're sure. going to get errant sure. answers. But they had to have meant that, right? Like they didn't do that on purpose? No. You would hope they would do it on purpose and then they would say, see, AI, AI makes a lot of errors. Instead, they're it it they are saying they won't launch their chatbot feature. Google is saying this until they're confident it will give quality answers. But Good. none of them do. I mean, they're all going to have the same problem. Did you by chance read the article in the New Yorker about uh, the using the analog that what you're seeing with like Jet, Chat GPT or these AIs where you make questions to? Yeah, he's making it sort of analogous to uh, what JPEG does to an image, which sort of blurs it out. Like if you if you tear down the compression i didn't see that article but it's a, it's really i like the idea i mean the idea makes a lot of sense yeah the metaphor is not perfect i think it's better than anything else that i've read but it talks about how like you're throwing away information that's ultimately what you're doing but you're i do also like that you're on a, on a chat bot hopefully you're getting your many sources and distilling it down yes. as opposed to just clicking one link where you could get errant information sure i'm a firm believer in in the, the saying that if six russians tell you you're drunk consider laying down now, the kind of th cool thing Google's going to add to it, they're going to include video and image searches as well as three-dimensional Google Maps that will create virtual tours 
inside the buildings based on two-dimensional pictures. I mean, th- there's there's no answer other than the fact we're all living in a simulation. They're dragging their feet it, to release this of course. W- by putting all these extra features into it and saying we have to be accurate. Obviously, Microsoft has no problem with the fact that Chat GPT is going to give out inaccurate information. Not sure they have no problem with it, but I think they're willing well, they're, to maybe a little more. Putting it out. They're putting it out. They're giving a little bit more room to it. I, don't uh, know. I think Chat GPT and, and I think all AI, if you're going to use it for search, needs citation. The other thing that I like a lot is voice. Oh, I like, yeah, for I sure. like being able to talk to my search engine and, and have it give me the answers back. But listen, have you tried this? Because I tried a few uh, queries on Google Home. I have these little Google yep. Home devices. Yes, me too. Which used to give terrible answers. And, and, and sure. for most questions, you'd ask them things and it would just say, yeah, I have no idea. Go look it up yourself. I started trying to see how good was the, was Google Home going to be at giving me answers, okay. a, a ser- typical search queries. Has it gotten better? Okay, good right? question. So I'll change the name of the activation phrase so that I don't trigger off every Google Where's the Home, fun in that? I know, that's, that's listening. And I'll just say, hey, Mr. G, should I eat oatmeal? On the website healthline.com, they say, oats are incredibly nutritious. They are a good source of carbs and fiber, including the powerful fiber beta-glucan. They are also a good source of high-quality protein with a good balance of essential amino acids. Oats are loaded with important vitamins, minerals, and antioxidant plant compounds. I also found an answer to this question. What happens if you eat oatmeal every day? Do you want to hear it? Yes. On the website eatingwell.com, they say, Making oatmeal a regular part of your menu can potentially lower your disease risk, help your gut health thrive, make bowel movements easier, and keep you feeling fuller for longer. So that made me want to task if Google Home could get right the question that Bard famously got wrong. Who took the very first pictures of a planet outside our solar system? On the website blogs.nasa.gov, they say, for the first time, astronomers have used NASA's James Webb Space Telescope to take a direct image of a planet outside our solar system. Yes, Google Home got it wrong, too. So I asked it to tell me what the Turing test was. According to Wikipedia, the Turing test, originally called the imitation game by Alan Turing in 1950, is a test of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to, or indistinguishable from, that of a human. Can you pass it? I don't mind if you can tell I'm not human. As long as I'm helpful, I'm all good. So the good news is Google Home has citations in voice, and it is actually pretty useful for search. It's looking like it's grabbing single sources. It's not, you know, grabbing a bunch of sources and putting the information together. But at least you get you get some sources. Microsoft's new Bing AI chat bot and you.com's helpful you chat both give sources. Uh, so wait, so your experience with Google Home yeah. was that it's better than Bard or just as bad? It gives the same ac- inaccurate the same information inaccurate because information. it's sources. Okay. If you listen to the way the NASA website phrases that particular bit of information, you can see why the Google uh, Bard and the Google Home device yeah. is, is getting confused. They say, for the first time, astronomers have used NASA's James Webb Space Telescope to take a direct image of a planet outside our solar system. Anyway, I don't know if you played, or, I don't know if you looked at all with the at the Bing. Bing GPT. I'm also on the wait list. Kind of cool that it has the information up to date. Right. That's, that's a bonus. That's yeah, a game yeah. changer. Yeah, that's sure. really cool. But the huge downside of Bing GTP, you got to use the Edge browser. Yeah, I got to believe that's going to be fixed real fast. Uh, it's not a great experience. It's got lots of obtrusive ads, constant data collection. I'll pass. Isn't Edge just Chromium now? Edge is Chromium, but it's got all the There's shit on top of it. Yeah, we're pulling all the all the data into I Microsoft that's gonna be fixed servers. Or proxied in no time. Currently, if you go to Bing uh-huh. GTP on, yep. uh, on Bing, it'll actually try to get you to move over to to ah. viewing it on Edge. You can't you can't see it on the browser. Just, Isn't this what Microsoft got sued for in the nineties? I feel like pretty it much a doing of this it. exact yeah, same yeah. thing. <laughs> also, that crazy computer voice that Google Home and Siri use that just sounds so robotic. Uh huh. Um, AI can fix that too. Make it sound less robotic or more robotic? Listen. This is nonsense. This is nonsense. Oh. Those are both AI generated voices. I think pretty much those AI generated voices now are getting so good. I mean, Apple's going to yeah. do Apple's going to do a series of audiobooks and they're going to use AI voicing for them. So it's good enough to listen to. I feel like I, I no longer want machines to pass the Turing test. You know what? I, we we've talked about this. Yeah. There needs to be a Turing 2 test. Sure. And that it's not just can you fool me that that you're a human being? Can you tell me something that a human, you know, like a human can tell a joke and they know what's funny? Sure. That's a leap that a computer really can't make at this point. Yeah, that should be the Turing two test. Can you? Super subjective. I like it. 
what I want to have dinner with what you. you get if you, what you get when you try to get a computer to write jokes is you get a whole bunch of, of non sequiturs that don't make sense and aren't funny. It kind of rattles like a joke, shapes like a joke, but it just isn't funny. Uh, I'm also surprised with all the time and effort. Lambda's been a project for a, a, a while. I'm surprised that the Google Lambda system isn't much farther along than the chat GPT. We have no way of knowing. I was going to say, you don't know that it is or that it isn't. You don't know right. what other aspects they've pushed through. I can tell you, Google has every incentive to not use the chat bot because 77% of their revenue comes from giving you those links that they get paid, you know, yeah. a little bit of money every time you click this one of those my, links. This is that, my Kodak model, right? Yeah. Like, they've got to, they kind of have to cut off the Kodak who created the digital the sensor. Digital sensor, yeah. Right. And sat on it. Like, they created in the 70s. They crazy. had a reason to sit on it, though. I the whole it. business they, model was built I mean, on film. Gen Zers don't know about the Kodak film huts, right? Those right. Used to oh, be they were things everywhere. Everywhere. So you could buy film. And then ISO 250. And you'd, and and you'd also come back and, and pay for processing. You yes. Had, you had, they had two revenue streams that, that were going to die. That entire market is gone. Yeah. Like, it's gone. Not smaller. It doesn't exist. So, so I, I feel like... There's a path that's similar on this. And you got, hope Google doesn't, you know, is not able to figure out how to monetize this so that they can, I don't care, I, I have no dog in this hunt really, but, but you would think they would want to observe history and they would- I gotta believe they've got a, a rooms full of eggheads working on this. But they have to figure out. out how to monetize it. If you're just giving people the answer and not the link, now you're not sending them to someone else's website who wants to pay you for sending them yeah. to someone else's website. I feel like monetization is a is a, a, an after problem. Like, get it to work well. Get it to add value. Get volume out of it. And I think the monetization will come. Well, mm -hmm. you got to figure it out at some point. You can't uh, you can't cut off 77% of your revenue and, and well, just be scrambling around looking going, you know, we got all these mouths to feed at our company. How are we going to do this? Yeah. I mean, look, if you're not going to, let's just, let's, for this thought experiment, presume that there's no way to monetize this. They still should roll it out because if they don't, someone else is going to. Right. So at least you can still control it and have the hope of doing something. You, you'll find the model. And if hypothetically you can't find the model, you might as well kill your own business, not someone else. Because your business will die either way. Either way. Right. It does sound an awful lot like Blockbuster not wanting to stream movies and now, you know, ask, Great somebody, idea, guys. ask somebody what Blockbuster is and they're like, yeah, block yeah. what? Yeah. Yeah, be kind. Please rewind. All right, let's hit the button and talk about the undisputed queen of the skies. So that piece on uh, the little dance at the Austin airport last yeah, week yeah. got me in an aviation mood. So I thought I'd talk well, a little it bit. it kind of got me in a non-aviation mood. No, I, no, I don't want to fly anywhere now. <laughs> yeah, well... Um, this might make it better. Okay, good. I'm not sure. We'll see. Um, do you know who the queen of the skies is? Have you ever heard this expression? The queen of the skies. Well, I know it's the 747 is what they call it. The 747. Queen. Who yeah. was the king of the skies? Why did they call it the queen of the skies? Um, I don't, I don't know. I, uh, that's a good question. Who would be the king of the skies? I have no idea. It's probably a blimp. Who's the prince of the skies? The Zeppelin. I'm not sure. There's a lot going on right sure. now. Sure. I don't really know who. The gesture of the si skies has to be sp spirit airways. <laughs> Jesus. Yes, probably. <laughs> We're going to come back to spirit in a minute. There's a spirit okay. joke period in here somewhere, too. <laughs> um, so uh, this is sort of the change of the guard. The last uh, 747 was delivered uh, a couple weeks ago. You know what's remarkable about that? Yeah. First of all, it's it's sentimental because we've had so many 747, so many iterations of 747. Yep. They changed it yep. over the years so Talk much. Talk about that. But and I don't, I don't mean to get ahead, but also it's it's so it's kind of sentimental that you've reached the end. Also, wow, was this thing yes. around a long time? Yes, you know about they, how long? I have no idea. Yeah, fifty plus years. Wow, isn't that crazy? I mean, how do you make yeah, a piece yeah. of technology that lasts that long? Well, good, on, good on them. I mean, they're almost entirely different aircraft from the beginning to the end. Like they're significantly different in size and efficiency. The the original seven forty seven to yes, the yeah, current yeah. seven. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna talk about that a yeah. little bit. So, um, there's some cool history behind this thing. It's the first wide-body airline ever produced, okay. right? And it's been in service nonstop since 1970. Tell me what you mean by wide-body. Uh, um, How do we define that? More like me, less like Kate Moss. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's been in service. I don't. Does that do it? Does that? Well, I, I can was, draw it for you. I you was to draw really it for thinking you? more on the interior. There are two aisles in a 747. Yes. There used to be one aisle in planes. Yep. <laughs> okay. Much like I have to put together two belts to get my yes. pants on. Okay. She has only one. Uh, the 747 is known for that distinctive upper deck, the hump. The hump, right. right. They, used Which, to be, they used to put piano bars up there. I know. And like, so like, cool. I know, so cool. And I guess, I didn't know this until I was reading about this. When it was originally sort of designed or sketched, that was going to be a full upper deck. 
Like oh, the really? intent was for really? them to be like the A three eighty, the full upper deck. The biggest challenge was they couldn't get the people off the plane fast enough sure. to be within the 90-second window to get certification, Yeah, which I, again, didn't know that. You, um, you need more holes. You d- yeah, yeah, more ejection seats. Uh, so anyway, it's one of the most recognizable aircrafts in the world. Right? I think everybody sure, that knows course, what a 747 looks like. Um, it's been used by airlines. It's for passengers, for cargo. Um, the remaining U.S. carriers that flew 74s retired them back in 2017. Yeah. So we haven't seen... Not that long ago. I know, not that long ago. We haven't really seen passenger U.S. carrier flights right. in five years, right, give or take. But you'll still see p- plenty flying around. I see them coming into LAX every day with cargo. Sure. Some passengers coming from overseas. Um, the first one flew almost exactly 54 years ago, February 9th, 1969. Wow. That's how long that thing's been around. Um, there have been over 1,500 of them made which is bonkers. Yeah. Uh, every single one's been built in Everett, Washington at Boeing's assembly site. Well, that's where you would build them, sure. Well, they build aircraft in South Carolina now, too. Oh, do they? They do, the 787. Um, but, uh, and the 73s, I think, are built there, too. Uh, anyway, that building that they purposely built for the 747 production line yeah. is the largest building in the world by volume. I see. And it has been since it was built. It's huge. Yeah. So it's about 13, uh, a little over 13 million cubic meters of space wow. right, by volume. And well, so that's right, because it's also tall. It's, it's tall, also has right? to be really yep. high. Yep. So uh, that's uh, about 13 times the size of the theoretical cargo airship I rambled on about in episode five, right? That giant right, airship. Right, They'll still gonna They're still going to build the 7 uh, 767, and the 777, and some of the 737 maxes in that facility. Okay. But the 74 is done, right? That line sure, is, sure. is done and gone. Um, roughly speaking, I have to believe that for the last couple of years, they've been just dribbling out a few here and there anyway. Well, that's, you know, they years ago, they were talking about canceling this because there's just no demand. They had yeah. a backlog of like 25 and you think about how long these take to build. Sure. You don't wait till you're down to zero. Right. right? You got to start winding it down ahead of time. So, um, there's over 150, 150 miles of wiring on a single 747, uh-huh. which is, which is bonkers. Um, and roughly speaking, over three and a half billion passengers have flown on seven fours since wow. their inception, which is just crazy. Uh, okay, how about some more interesting stuff? Yeah, there's more than ten variants of the seven four, as you mentioned earlier. They've been produced over the we years. We call them seven fours. That's I our, call them seven four. Uh, our slang? aviation dorks. Yeah, slang. You okay. go to the last. Okay. You just drop the last digit. You know, everybody knows it's a seven. Um, so why uh, is it a seven? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Um, I mean, they start with a seven oh seven, and it's right. Just, uh, um, what are we on? Seven eighty seven slot machines, probably seven eighty sevens. They're yeah. they're not most recent aircraft, but they're highest number. If that makes any sense. Um, anyway, there's been more than ten variants of this built over the years. Like all good Americans, the seven four seven has gotten bigger and fatter as time has gone on. Sure, the original seven four seven one hundred had a typical uh, three class capacity of three hundred sixty six passengers, whereas the latest seven forty seven eight can hold a uh, hundred passengers more. Right? Wow. So they've made this thing quite a bit bigger. Sure. Um, and based on exit limits, you could shove as many as 500 to 600 people, passengers, in a 7478, which is which is pretty incredible. It's a lot of people. How much bigger it's gotten. It's got to have brought the cost of aviation down. Sort of, yeah. But fortunately... Because you're still um, only pay, like, paying for, what, you know, three people in the cockpit. and Yeah. Okay, so you can get up to 600 passengers in one of these 7478s. Right? Mm-hmm. Thankfully... Spirit Airlines has yet to purchase a uh, 747 to do this. Yeah. But I'm assuming once they hear this episode, they'll be all over it. And sure, maybe it'll sure. help them get out of this whole antitrust thing. The Biden administration is <laughs> trying to shut down their <laughs> the merger with blue JetBlue. Yeah, yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah. Like, but we can put 700 people on a plane. They'll all be miserable. Um, range has been increased on these things. Original 100s uh, could fly about 4,600 nautical miles. Uh-huh. Whereas the latest um, uh, 747-8s can fly 7,700 miles. That's a big difference. It's a big, yeah, it's like a 66% increase. 50 years, 50 years increase. of advancing technology. Yeah, better aerodynamics, yeah. better engines, right? Um, and then you get into some of these these variant configurations that are, I think, super cool to aviation nerds like me. Uh, some of my favorites are the 747 Large Cargo Freighter, which was later renamed to the Dreamlifter. Yep. This is a modified 747 with a large outsized cargo uh, that was designed to carry parts for the 787. So it looks like... Oh, wow. Yeah, it just looks like a beluga whale and a 747 had a baby. Yeah, like this thing yeah, is, yeah. It's super ugly, but it's like a different kind of ugly than the A380 ugly, if that makes any sense. Yeah. But they're they're super cool. Um, of course, I think most everybody, at least in the U.S., knows about the shuttle carrier aircraft. We've there seen were, it. Yeah. There were two of those. Yeah, it flew through L.A. These were modified 747-100s that carried space shuttles yeah. during the initial testing and then later carrying the orbits sort of all around the, the planet. 
Um, for our Gen Z listeners, think of that as like an Uber for the space shuttle. It's basically yeah, what it was. which is which is a, not a small thing to carry. No, no, it's uh, it's a little heavy. Of course, the seven four seven has been used by the Air Force uh, to shuttle around presidents and VIPs. There, the first two of those, which are known as the VC twenty fives, were built on uh, two hundred class seven four seven two hundreds and put in service in nineteen ninety. Uh, the su- successors are being built right now. That's the VC twenty five B, as in as in Bravo, and that's based on the seven four seven eight I, the eight inter- intercontinental. So um, we've seen these things around, but even cooler than the VC twenty fives, I think, are what are called the E four Bs. So this is an airborne command post that was designed for use in nuclear war and is also operated by the U.S. Air Force. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's four of these guys. They were initially deployed in 74 as the National Emergency Airborne Command Post, or the NEACP, otherwise known as the kneecap. Yeah, sure. They literally call this thing the kneecap. And this is, um, and I didn't appreciate this, this is what the Secretary of Defense prefers to use for transportation when traveling outside of the U.S., so that if shit goes sideways, they're on some He's aircraft that has comms. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, and also, whenever the the presidential aircraft, the VC-25, is deployed outside of North America, an E-4B will always deploy next to it at a second airport in the vicinity. Always have redundancy. So they always have that there. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty cool. Um, but look, much, uh, much like Ted Lasso, all good things must come to an end. Earlier this month, one day after delivery to Atlas Air, the last Boeing 747 performed a flight path drawing a crown and a giant 747 on its way from Washington to Kentucky, saying goodbye to the Boeing 747 forever. Aww. But it was pretty cool to see that they drew this big 747 in the sky over like Spokane. That's very, yeah, that's very pretty, sweet. Pretty neat. Anyway, 747, the we end love of, you. The end of an era. Yeah. Quickly now, before we go, have you seen or read anything good this week? I have. Uh, the uh, McCheapest.com. What's that? Uh, it shows you the price discrepancy of Big Macs across the U.S., and it's absolutely fascinating to see these price gradients between like three dollars fifty cents and eight bucks. But it's got to be because the rent's higher in some places than it is in other places, right? Uh, I presume the the burgers are different sizes. Oh, okay. I would think McDonald's would all be the same. You would I, think, I would think that. they would uniform those things. I don't, maybe you have to make your own at the cheap places. I've got one called Crunk on Earth. It's a British mockumentary television series about an ill-informed investigative reporter. It's really funny. Sounds she, amazing. She has this amazing deadpan delivery you will love. What? Uh, wh- where do I find this? Uh, it's on one of the streaming services. Uh, helpful, as always. Yeah. I'll be sure to I get it on out. my Chromecast. <laughs> yeah. Also not helpful. Sure. I see it on my TV. I think great. You, right, I think great. You, I think Thanks. You probably see it on your Roku. I watch it with my eyes. Perfect. <laughs> what else do you have to point me in the right direction? That's the episode. Thanks for joining us for all this nonsense. A truly terrible podcast from The Awful Company. I'm CJ Little. I'm Jeff Parker. If you like this program, please follow, download, subscribe, and like at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, wherever you get your podcasts. Special thanks to our floor director, Richard Parker. Thank you, Richard. We'll be here every Wednesday morning for more nonsense. Please join us. KF60WA Heavy, signing off.